She was born into polygamy. Her family followed the teachings of Joseph Smith, including plural marriage. Like many young girls, she had been promised to a man who was her father's age. But she ran away. She chose hell over a life of polygamy. That girl was me. I was lost, alone, desolate. Then Jesus Christ found me and rescued me. In his love, I found real freedom. He is a shield to all who will take refuge in him. This is why I can look back and ask, polygamy, what love is this? Welcome to Polygamy, What Love Is This? I'm Doris Hansen, your host, and polygamy in the Bible is often used as being the reason for today's Mormon polygamy, yet the Bible never once commands people to live polygamy. Before we get started on today's show, we would like you to know that we help people leave polygamy and we continue helping them after they've left. You can call our toll-free number 877-425-9993 for a private and confidential discussion of your situation and how we can help you. You can go to our website, shieldandrefuge.org, for information about our ministry. And if you want to contact us about any of our shows or to be a guest, you can email us at email at whatloveisthis.tv. Our show is also available on iTunes podcast, or the audio can be downloaded from soundcloud.com slash whatloveisthis, or just go to our website's main page for more information. And now to get on with the show, we would like to thank Earl Erskine, our co-host. Thanks for having me again. And thank you it's, for it's so fascinating. hanging out. Yeah, <laughs> hanging out with you. But it's just so fascinating. And, <clears throat> and none of this really we know about in, right. in mainstream Mormonism. And here you polygamists suffer with this. and Yeah. So so much. Suffer with a lot from with this nonsense. <laughs> yeah. And we've been discussing Brigham Young, who's the second president of and prophet of the Mormon mm -hmm. religion. And ended last time deep into the discussion of his polygamy. I'd like to mention here that you say the polygamists suffer much because polygamy has the same books, they have the same presidents, yeah. they have the same history, they share, we all, the we, they, they share the same Mormon yeah. uh, doctrine and history. Up really through 1890, I guess, right? And mm -hmm. even the prophets after that, some of them, Heber J. Them. Grant and others had. Yeah plural wives. He had, Heber J. Grant had three wives at one time, yeah. yes. And, and part of our information that we've been discussing is taken from a little book uh, that we've quoted from. It's entitled Brigham Young and His Wives and the True Story of Plural Marriage, written by John J. Stewart, published in 1961. And he explains why polygamy is so wonderful and how Brigham Young was such a great godly polygamous man. The writer of this little book unwittingly believed that Brigham Young maintained a peaceful, harmonious household in spite of its many wives and children. We quote. Yeah, this, this is what he had to say. Each evening, Brigham Young and his wives and children gathered together for a family hour. The program included prayer, songs, scripture reading, discussion of the gospel. In all the household chores, there was a carefully arranged cooperative effort among the wives and children. The young household was an exceedingly happy and harmonious one, blessed with the Spirit of the Lord and characterized by unselfish love and mutual respect among all members. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa, he's living in that goddess goddesshood land there. And of course, this might be the writer's opinion, but it's certainly not based on fact. Even according to Brigham Young himself, his household was not harmonious and peaceful. In fact, Brigham Young gave a sermon to everyone, including his own wives, where he complained about their complaining. And part of his sermon went like this. This is from the Journal of Discourses. No wonder they're so discredited. <laughs> it is frequently happening that women say they are unhappy. Men will say, my wife... Though a most excellent woman has not seen a happy day since I took my second wife. No, not a happy day for a year, says one, and another has not seen a happy day for five years. But I know that there is no cessation to the everlasting whining of many of the women in this territory. And if the women will turn from the commandments of God 
and continue to despise the order of heaven, I will pray that the curse of the Almighty may be close to their heels and that it may be following them all the day long. Prepare yourselves for two weeks from tomorrow, and I will tell you now that if you will tarry with your husbands after I have set you free, you must bow down to it and submit yourselves to the celestial law. You may go where you please after two weeks from tomorrow, but remember that I will not hear any more of this whining. So he was so sick of it, he wanted to let them all go. Sounds harmonious. It sounds it? very <laughs> harmonious. And of course, he didn't say these things to happy and satisfied plural wives, obviously. And he included his own plural wives in his diatribe. Now, many, many wives during that time and ever since, including his own, have complained about the trials and the pain and the loneliness and the lack of resource that the polygamist lifestyle requires. And why, my question, when Jesus teaches us yeah. to love and bless each other and not to curse, why did Brigham Young say, I will pray that the curse of the Almighty might be close at their heels and that it may follow them all the day long? Can this be considered a godly person a that would prophet, say that? A prophet of God. A, yeah, a godly yeah. leader that would call a curse down on his own plural wives who were suffering a life of deprivation deprivation and, yeah. and suffering and loneliness. Oh, no. In 1868, Brigham Young, at the age of 67, married 24-year-old Anne Eliza Webb. Now, he had been pressuring her and pursuing her and intimidating her for a very long time until she finally quit fighting against his marriage proposal. She was an attractive woman. She was either divorced or in the process of divorcing her husband and the mother of two children. Of course, by then, Brigham already had married dozens of other women. At best, this plural marriage was a disaster. Previous to her finally consenting to become his plural wife, Brigham had financially ruined her brother in a manipulated business matter. And Eliza had a lot to say about her marriage to Brigham Young and about him personally. Very little of it is positive and certainly does not portray <laughs> a godly character or a godly man. Now, we can understand to a certain extent negative comments coming from a woman who'd been hurt and neglected sure. by her husband as she had been. And there are too many other, but there's too, way too many other testimonies from other people, other sources that attribute accuracy to her assessment of his character. After seven years of neglect of marriage mm. to Brigham Young, she decided to divorce him and get out of town, as it were. Well, Anne Eliza charged Brigham with neglect, cruelty, and desertion, and she perceived a legal divorce. The case came to trial in 1875. She asked for a huge alimony. He's worth eight million, she announced, and has an income of 40,000 a month. Balderdash retorted the church leader. His fortune did not exceed 600,000, and his income was but 6,000 a month. He offered to pay her a hundred a month to settle, when she refused, he retaliated by pointing out his marriage to the former Miss Webb was not legal because in the eyes of the law, he was the husband of Mary Ann Angel, his first wife. Unless, of course, the courts would recognize Mormon plural marriage, something it had stubbornly refused to do for the low these past 30 years. Ann Eliza, Brigham railed, was nothing but an extortionist, and that was that. The case dragged on through the courts, but in the end it was found that Ann Eliza was not legally married to Brigham Young, so there could be no divorce and no alimony. A judge tried to force Brigham to pay 9500 uh, alimony in arrears while the suit was being adjudicated, but he refused. Ann Eliza settled for court costs and 100 a month, Brigham's original <laughs> offer. <laughs> that, that must have been quite a deal. It would have been interesting to be a fly on the wall in some of those conversations. There, there's no record that Eliza made application for a church divorce. Oh. Of course, by the time this was over, she knew the church wasn't true. But the church did excommunicate her, and she devoted much of the rest of her life to publishing her memoirs and giving lectures around the country exposing the truth about Mormon polygamy. Mm. And she wrote a book entitled Wife Number 19, The Story of a Life in Bondage, which records life in early Utah, her marriage to Brigham Young, the polygamous lifestyle, as well as political and economic events of those early days. And that book is well worth reading. 
Brigham Young was sealed to so many women he couldn't keep track of them. Not to mention keeping track of his own children from so many wives, we quote. Yeah. This is funny. Brigham met a lady in the streets of Salt Lake City several years since who recognized him and addressed him as Brother Young, greeting him quite cordially. He scrutinized her closely with a puzzled expression. I know I've seen you somewhere, he said. Your face is very familiar, but I cannot recall you. <laughs> You're right, she replied she. You have most certainly seen me before. I was married to you ten years ago. I have never seen you since, she continued, but my memory is more retentive than yours, for I knew the moment <laughs> I knew you the moment I saw you. <laughs> That's amazing, is it not? And of course, I know of a situation where cur current yeah. situation where the a man with several wives, well over thirty. Um, had to ask one of his wives if Are a certain child, no, oh. if that's if a certain child belonged to those two, oh. or he knew it was his, but he didn't know which wife she belonged oh, to, gosh. which is basically the kind of a mess you get into. Yeah, uh, and it does matter, by the way, it does matter. Of course, it does. Yeah. <laughs> Brigham Young embraced a bad and a corrupted theology, which included appropriating spiritual power and authority that actually belonged to Jesus Christ and are not transferable from Jesus to anyone else ever. As an example, I want to quote from a friend on Facebook who wrote some interesting comments. He quoted Brigham Young like this. For unbelievers, we will quote from the scriptures, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Again, hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. I will now give my scripture. Whosoever confesseth that Joseph Smith was sent of God to reveal the Holy Gospel to the children of men and lay the foundation for gathering Israel and building up the kingdom of God on the earth, that Spirit of God, and every spirit that does not confess that God has sent Joseph Smith and revealed the everlasting gospel to and through him is of Antichrist, no matter whether it is found in a pulpit or on a throne, nor how much divinity it may profess, nor what it professes with regard to revealed religion and the account that is given of the Savior and his Father in the Bible. They may say that they acknowledge him until doomsday, and he will never own them, nor bestow the Holy Spirit upon them, and they will never have visions of eternity open to them unless they acknowledge that Joseph Smith is sent of God. Such people I call unbelievers. Now that's usurping <laughs> some power that yeah. belongs and, and a position that belongs only to Jesus Christ. Yeah, it sure does. And it's very blasphemous yeah. to believe that and to preach that. Uh, Joseph Smith nor Brigham Young or any other person has any say about anyone's eternal life that belongs to Jesus Christ alone. Now, Brigham Young had a brother. His name was Joseph Young, and he was a member of the First Council yeah. of the Seventy. And he inserted the name of Joseph Smith and Brigham Young in a paraphrase of Romans <laughs> chapter 10, verse 9. So first, we're going to look at the unchanged verse from the King yeah. James Bible. Then we're going to look at how Brigham's brother changed it. A new translation. <laughs> Romans 10, 9, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So now we have right here the center of salvation is Jesus Christ alone, sure right? Sounds like it. Mm -hmm. And so this is Joseph Young changed it to read this. Believe in God, believe in Jesus, and believe in Joseph his prophet, and in Brigham his successor. And I add, if you will believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Christ, and Joseph was a prophet, and that Brigham was his successor, you shall be saved in the kingdom of God, which I pray in the name of Jesus may be the case. Amen. So we have co-saviors here. Right? Uh, Jesus and then Joseph so. and then Brigham are co-saviors because you can't, according to him, you can't go to heaven. According to Brigham, you can't go to heaven without confessing the names of these people alongside so, Jesus Christ. Jesus, yeah. Now, this is man worship. And isn't that relying on the arm of flesh like they claim we're not supposed to do? That's right. Definitely no, is. No other idols before me. <laughs> no, other, uh, no other idols, right. Now... Regarding some of the things that Brigham Young would say, um, he said something about birth control or families who desire to limit the number of children they had. He said this, 
<laughs> there are multitudes of pure and holy spirits waiting to take tabernacles. Now what is our duty? To prepare tabernacles for them, to take a course that will not tend to drive those spirits into the families of the wicked, or they will be trained in wickedness, debauchery, and every species of crime. It is the duty of every righteous man and woman to prepare tabernacles for all the spirits they can. This is the reason why the doctrine of plurality of wives was revealed, that the noble spirits which are waiting for tabernacles might be brought forth. So here we have the reason for polygamy. And, and also notice that hidden in, in these verses are that everybody that's not a Mormon is wicked. Is wicked. Right. And, and there, there's no morality or goodness or kindness with them, only with the Mormon people. That is what is being taught in these kinds of sermons. Yeah. Now, of course, what he said is difficult to believe simply because one man with seven wives <laughs> cannot produce more children than seven monogamous marriages can That's produce true. at all. And besides that, no one, it, 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 it isn't anyone's business what a married couple decides to do about having a family. It's between them and God and no one else, and especially is not to be dictated by their religious leader. And because the Bible teaches that the spiritual did not come first, but the physical did, and Joseph Smith did not change that in his own version of the Bible, there can be no spirits in heaven waiting to be born. Unless you go against what Joseph Smith yeah. recognized in the Bible. Now, many people believe and teach that Brigham Young was one of the greatest men that ever lived. But being a successful autocratic patriarch with dozens of wives and lots of children does not make a man great. No. Brigham Young advised this about telling others about our weaknesses. Now, I found this interesting. I don't know if it found, if you were, yeah. but you were a bishop yeah. and, and you had people come and confess to you. Right. And of course, we know about miracle forgiveness and all that yeah. nonsense. Yeah. And then we read this, what Brigham Young taught. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just a, a, just a level of deception. If you have your weaknesses, keep them hid from your brethren as much as you can. <laughs> that sounds like a Temple Recommend interview. Uh, <laughs> well, I have that posted on the bishop's desk, you know. Uh, <laughs> keep them hid from your brethren keep as much as you hid. can. And then he went on to say this. If you've sinned against your God or against yourselves, confess to God and keep the matter to yourselves, for I do not want to know anything about it. <laughs> So, so we wonder why now they require confession to a bishop. Yeah, uh, repentance uh, process. Right, yeah. when their own prophet said to keep quiet and to keep it hidden and confess it to God and keep the matter to themselves. Now I think it's kind of odd how changing Mormonism is. This is just one, to totally, yeah. one proof of that. Uh, and although confessing to a re religious leader is not a biblical requirement, Brigham's comment serves to prove his own admission of his misunderstanding of the Bible. And we talked about that a yeah. couple of weeks ago, uh, as we discussed before. But we want to contrast what he said with James chapter 5, verse 16. Confess your faults, <clears throat> excuse me, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now, this isn't a requirement to run to your bishop no. and, and confess at all. That's not what it means. It, it, it means that if we've done something against someone else, that we should go to that person, talk to them about it, and ask for their forgiveness. But Brigham Young advised, don't say anything to anybody. Keep it hidden. Keep it to yourself. Don't run to your bishop. And don't you don't have to go through all those hoops to receive God's forgiveness That's or the right. bishop's forgiveness or whatever else it is that they think you need to do between the person and God alone. Let's talk about Brigham Young as the Mormon dictator. Now he did rule with an iron fist. Uh, marriages and divorces and choices and decisions were all required to go through Brigham Young first. And of course that's how polygamy groups operate today. And an interesting bit of information is what he thought of the regular Mormon person getting an education. Yeah, this is kind of funny. In respect to education, Brigham Young, himself an illiterate man, and the leading elders frowned upon every attempt to raise the intellectual status of the people. And so little encouragement was given that no one could afford to keep school. The consequence was that the boys and girls grew up with little more education than their own sense of necessity taught them to acquire for themselves. And it was not until very recently that any suitable efforts were made to supply trained teachers and to 
open schools in which a thorough education could be afforded. I find that interesting, and, and we'll find, a, uh, as we talk a little bit more about this, evidently Orson Pratt, who was the in-house intellect yeah. for the early Mormons, he was the only person who dared to speak up publicly in favor of a proper education. At one time, after he had encouraged the Mormons to take advantage of any opportunity to read and study books, Brigham Young got up and purposely opposed Orson Pratt's remarks. He did it like this. <laughs> a little, little sarcastic here, too. <laughs> the professor has told you that there are many books in the world, and I tell you that there are many people there. That there are many people there, yeah. In the world, he yeah. Yeah. He says there is something in all these books, and I say each of those persons has got a name. It would do you just as much good to learn those somebody's names as it would to read those books. Five minutes revelation would teach me more truth than all this pack of nonsense that I should have packed away in my unlucky brains from books. <laughs> so they named a university after yeah. him. It's kind of Brigham interesting. Young University. Yeah, yeah that they would, they would name the university after someone who discouraged education and thought that knowing the names of everybody in the world was more important than knowing what well, written is written in these books. Yeah, books. Um, and, and of course, it's the time, you know, Fanny Stenhouse, she wrote an uh, expose entitled Tell It All, and she explains more of this in chapter 19, page 270, uh, that Brigham Young is said to have never read a book in his life, and that the Mormon leadership discouraged every attempt to education and self-improvement. Later, however, in Mormonism, greater efforts were made for youth to obtain a good education. We quote, Brigham Young is an uneducated man. For that, of course, he is not deserving of blame, but his opposition to education in others and to all that is intellectual and elevating does him little credit. Only a very few years ago, he was with two counselors, Heber C. Kimball and Jedediah M. Grant, who were both spoken of as model saints, held forth in the tabernacle in the most unmeasured language against <coughs> schools and scholastic acquirements of every description. They were all three untaught men, and like all persons of small mind who have not themselves received any education, they hated and affected to despise those who had. But the Mormon leaders, while they ridiculed and affected to despise men of education, were shrewd enough to see that if schools were established and the children of the saints permitted to attend them, the bonds of superstition would certainly be shaken and the fabric of Mormonism undermined. They consequently discouraged every attempt at self-improvement and taught the people to aspire to nothing higher for their children than the rudiments of reading, writing, and arithmetic for the boys and a knowledge of household, dairy, and farm work for the girls. So, and, and that's interesting because so much of this early Mormonism that took place during Brigham Young's leadership of the pioneer Mormons is, is practiced today in today's polygamy groups. Oh. They, they, they disparage education, um, and when I was still in the group, it was, it was okay for uh, anybody to drop out of school. They didn't encourage you even to get a high school diploma. And did you generally go to public school? We did at the time, but now they've acquired, now a lot of them have acquired their own, they didn't homeschool then, oh, okay. uh, but a lot of them now have acquired their own group owned school, and so they send oh. their kids there so they can get away keep from, a on keep a too, big yeah. control on it, that's true. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that, to see that this is still passed down into the polygamy groups. And of course the attitude of the LDS Church today, no matter their reverence of Brigham Young, um, is different. They, they do of course now um, aspire to higher education. But it was the attitude of Brigham Young at the time and obviously of some of the other leaders um, that he said these things. And, and the attitude of today's Mormon polygamy, like I say, is the same with the exception of a few in some of the polygamy group. Most of the members are encouraged to go to work uh, for their group businesses mm -hmm. right out of high school or even drop out and not to seek a higher education. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of their special members are allowed and encouraged to get degrees in law or certain medical yeah, sure. degrees or accounting mm. if it will benefit the group, the group to yeah. get that degree. But it also it seems like Brigham Young's thinking changed as he grew older because uh, he would often contradict himself and, and many of his sermons and discourses throughout the time of his leadership. Well, didn't, they, didn't we read, I think, either last time or something that he 
admitted to never having read the Bible or he hadn't read it for many years or something. And, uh, he did. And he didn't understand it. And here's a prophet of God. You just think, it, it, is it so funny that he would uh, have these, I don't know, this attitude. I, he was just so bold in, in what he did and said. And uh, yeah. He had uh, people following him. And uh, he, he did say that he had... Um, hadn't read the Bible for years because he mm -hmm. hadn't had the time. And when he did read it, he didn't understand what he was reading. <laughs> That's what he said. Oops. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, oops. And then he proceeded to tell people what to think, how to interpret what they're reading in the Bible. Uh -huh. and, and yet he admitted he didn't understand it either. And how to get to heaven. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and, then, and then again, in this that you just read, um, his revelations were more educational to him than any book could be. Yeah. But the Bible tells us to test the spirits, and and He tells everybody to test the spirits. Not all revelations are from God, mm. and Joseph Smith himself said that not all yeah. revelations from God. Some of them are man's opinion. Some of them are from God, and some of them are from the devil. So <laughs> you know we got to have some standard of truth, a measurement of truth, to hold up anything or feelings you know we talk about feelings and things yeah. like that and the measure of truth God has given us is his word the Bible which is not changeable doesn't change and hasn't changed so that's the end of our part, uh, part three, three of Brigham Young next time will be our final discussion about him and his leadership and we'll talk more about his poly his polygamy and about his iron-fisted rule <laughs> and pick up some interesting dumb quotes <laughs> Some well. more surprising things from the Journal <laughs> his, of Discourses. His odd teachings, yeah. 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 So anyway, I hope this is being helpful to our viewers. And like we said last time, encouraging them to check these things out. Yeah, do a little study. Yeah, study for yourselves. Uh, because um, you are going to be responsible when you answer to God. And if you just say you believe because somebody else told you something, that's not going to be a good enough answer to him. No, it isn't. Thank you, Earl, you again. Bet. You bet. You know, anyone who enters into heaven will do so based on only one thing, the merits of Jesus Christ on their behalf. And it won't be because they're worthy or because God loves everyone so everyone will be saved. It won't be because there's no hell, nor because you went to the temple or because you live polygamy. Jesus came to rescue each one of us because he loves each one of us and because we need rescuing from the consequences of our sins. Now, people don't like to hear that, and not very many people believe it or will ask Jesus to rescue them. But truth doesn't change just because we don't like it or because we don't believe it. Jesus suffered our punishment. We are not worthy, nor can we be worthy of his grace. Only those who will do it his way will enter the kingdom of God. Read John chapter 3, which explains it all in beautiful detail. Thanks for watching.